Lon Hart. Um, Hart sits within the Canadian Federation of Medical Students. And this is an organization that represents about 8,000 medical students across Canada. And within the Federation, there's um, various portfolios. One of the portfolios is global health. Um, and within the portfolio of global health, there are uh, six committees. Uh, these range from partnerships that the CFMS has developed uh, for students. Um, there's also a portfolio or a committee on um, education around global health. There's an education, there's a, a committee on indigenous health, a committee on sexual and reproductive health. Um, within the global health portfolio, HEART is a task force. And this was established in 2016, um, recognizing that uh, medical students need to learn more and uh, advocate around uh, the health impacts of climate change. Um, so after the initiation of HEART in 2016 as a task force, um, we've worked since then and, and most recently in 2018, um, we've developed this HEART network, which is a sort of an attempt to develop um, better links with local schools. And so now we have about 150 med students across the country who join for our sometimes join for our meetings, um, which we hold every two weeks, but also are continually updated of our work through a monthly newsletter. Um, and we hope to build better connections with those groups going forward. So kind of like uh, CAPE has been doing their Faces of CAPE campaign, we have our Humans of Heart up here. These are um, some of the very active, um, some of the committee members and some of our very active uh, network members who attend our bi-weekly meetings regularly. Um, and we just wanted to make sure that they were acknowledged for all of the hard work that they do because um, all of the projects that we run are a massive team effort. So. Uh, these are the humans of heart. Okay, so um, I want to speak a little bit about what we do. We're a national group of students. Um, the task force has, has approximately 10 people with a number of very engaged network members. Um, and we're really focusing on three sort of core areas, advocacy, action, and education. Um, advocacy around the impacts, action in terms of, of the healthcare system itself, um, Dr. Courtney Howard uh, on a recent uh, webinar um, indicated or reminded us that, that uh, the healthcare system in Canada is the third highest emitter in the world per capita. Um, and then lastly, we have education. And this has been a key um, part of the mandate of HEART from the beginning was how do we better produce a workforce of, of healthcare practitioners who are engaged and understand the links between health and, and, and our environment. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. I can't hear you all of a sudden, but that's okay. I'll just talk. Um, <laughs> so, um, in terms of the work that HART has been doing, we have been, um, we've been very active and increasingly active, as you'll see, since uh, we were first started. But in um, kind of the first uh, projects that HART was engaged in was developing a set of core planetary health competencies. and that um, since 2017 has involved into 13 topics spanning um, various different aspects of planetary health from um, reproductive health to uh, in indigenous health um, and uh, everything in between, including um, health impacts of air pollution, et cetera. Um, we've been lucky enough to have many student and physician collaborators, many of those um, physicians from CAPE, such as Dr. Courtney Howard, and um, we've been recently recognized internationally by the International Federation of Medical Student Associations, who are developing now their own set of um, competencies based on, or not based on, but uh, sort of inspired by the work that HEART started back in 2017. Um, as well, kind of since our inception, we've been developing this national network that George referred to, and that's been expanding since then. And then um, we have a wonderful, um, a wonderful committee member, Kelsey McQueen, who has been um, creating monthly newsletters and sending those out to the network to keep them engaged, help, um, help share the work that we've been doing and um, reach out to them whenever there is something local that Hart wants to implement at each school. Yeah, 
Yeah, and sort of building on this, um, we've developed this timeline so you can see some of our work, but it there's a lot of things that span over many months. Um, but I guess what we want to showcase is that a lot of the work that has been going on has been building for several years now, um, just as the interest and, and engagement among medical students has been building. Um, so in 2019, in, in um, April, we had a fantastic social media campaign around uh, Earth Week. And then later that year, in, in September 2019, uh, many medical students joined for the Global Day of Action around climate change, um, initiated with the Fridays for Future group um, or movement. And um, we, we estimated we had approximately 200 medical students out on the day for the march. Um, which was pretty exciting. And within, over that course of the year, we've also published a series of op-eds and sort of um, articles explaining the work that we do and, and why this is relevant for medical students. Um, and we have a few of them listed right there in the CMAJ blog in the province. So, um... I'm sorry, I still can't hear you guys, but I'll just hope that practicing with George earlier worked um, <laughs> and I know what he said. Um, but uh, so in terms of our national, in terms of um, the work that we've done so far in 2020, um, as you can see, we've continued kind of ramping up the work that we've done and, and um, certainly George and I starting as co-chairs in 2019 have really taken advantage of all of the work that was put in by the students who came before us. Um, but in, uh, as George may have alluded to, um, starting in 2019, we began collecting um, survey responses from schools asking about their uh, planetary health curriculum. And, um, and in early January of 2020, we published the results of this report on the HEART website, as well as commentary written by George and um, a number of other Heart Committee members in the Lancet Planetary Health to uh, share with schools across Canada kind of the successes and areas for improvement within those schools and actually made some recommendations based on the data that we collected to help schools um, determine how they could improve or uh, what specific strengths other schools had that they could um, build on themselves. And this actually sparked meetings with at least seven medical school deans. So it was very encouraging to see that this was both a bottom up approach where um, many of the amazing students in our network brought the report to their medical school administrators. And then also, um, Kind of a bit more of a top-down um, strategy where deans actually um, received the report from uh, the president of the CFMS, Victor Doe, and um, agreed to meet with their medical students. So that was great to see. Um, then COVID-19 came along and sort of derailed some of uh, those meetings, but didn't derail the rest of Hart's work. So um, since then, we've still been very active, and a few of the projects that we've worked on since then have been um, developing a um, objectives for the Medical Council of Canada, so, um, or the MCC. So the MCC is um, the organization that develops objectives that determine what medical students are tested on their lic licensing exams. So they, um, after we published our report, they asked the CFMS and HART to um, develop a disaster preparedness objective. And um, then we had some success with that. We got excellent feedback and decided, um, hey, this would be a great opportunity to try and formally get planetary health um, onto the licensing exam. So we also proposed a planetary health objective and they brought that forward to the objective blueprint committee and are um, proposing it, I believe it's this month or next month. Um, we had a few other successes since COVID has started. So we ran an excellent Earth Week um, campaign and many of our committee members were heavily involved in making sure that that was successful. But um, one part that was particularly exciting was that we had a message to our leaders campaign and we asked medical students across Canada to share with their um, leaders, be it their uh, political leaders, their medical administration, about messages that they had learned um, from COVID that were particularly relevant to um, the planetary health crisis that we're facing. And we actually had some um, people tweet or email their MPs and we had a number of MPs, including Carolyn Bennett, tweet back, um, as well as more than 34,000 Twitter impressions. I'm 
fairly new to Twitter, but that was exciting for us. <laughs> um, and then finally, we've been sharing our work with um, both uh, the national and international community. So uh, CAPE has been kind enough to give us this platform to share our work with Canadian um, physicians. And then we also earlier this week shared um, some of our work with the international community through the International Federation of Medical Student Associations um, and, and partnered with the Australian Medical Student Association's Code Green group to kind of help um, tell stories about what has worked for us and where we've found successes to kind of inspire groups, um, similar groups in other countries to, to do the same. Okay, and, and I just want to add one more point that we didn't really have room on the slide to add, but one, one other avenue that we're engaging on education is uh, we've sent a letter um, with IFMSA or FMEQ um, and uh, with the support of Victor Doe and the CFMS to um, the accrediting body for medical schools to approach them to see if they would um, be willing to include planetary health as a, um, or teaching around planetary health as part of the accreditation uh, for medical schools. So we're trying a few different prongs in our approach. Um, but I want to speak a little bit to the next steps of, of areas of work that we're trying to build into. Um, and during this period of, of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we've, uh, we've tried to develop um, various partnerships with other organizations, uh, including a number of student groups, um, including uh, sort of public health masters groups, um, students, uh, nursing students as well. Um, and in particular, I want to speak a little bit about the, the Greening Healthcare Project. Um, this was a, a partnership of a few different groups and um, Owen will speak uh, much more detail about this a little bit later. Um, but it was uh, based on this application that was put forward for a strategic innovation fund, uh, which was a fund through the CFMS um, designed to uh, fund initiatives that would help students become sort of physician leaders in an area. Uh, so we're excited that, that Owen and, and his uh, partner Jacob, who are leading this initiative, have secured the funding and, and uh, we're excited to partner and, and build on that going forward. Um, and lastly, uh, before I go on, I want to say that, um, you know, with the climate change, anthropogenic climate change is, is so rooted in um, the the processes and, and systems of, of the same processes and, and systems of colonization. Um, and we haven't really yet engaged with that fully as a heart team um, in the work that we do, but we are very keen to um, improve what we do and, and build this in as a, as a key part of, of uh, the cornerstone of what we do. And so, um, we're very keen to uh, and have initiated in, uh, sort of conversations with, with Yoda Gallo and, and others um, that we would hope to engage with around developing a protocol for Indigenous engagement. Um, and, and this would hopefully infuse all the things we do in, in a sort of agenda setting um, a way to ensure that what we're doing is, is not perpetuating or, or continuing um, systems of oppression. And this is really important as medical students because we are existing and working within the medical system, which is itself a, a system that has been used for oppression in the past. Um, so Yoda Gala will speak a little bit more about that and about her work um, in the future. And, and uh, yeah, just wanted to raise that. Okay. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can hear now. Um, so before we move on to uh, giving the floor to Owen and Yoda Gallo, I just want to quickly talk about some of the other work that Heart supports. Um, so we've made a lot of partnerships um, over the past few years and have had the opportunity to support um, some fantastic initiatives. So some of you may have heard about the National Carbon Fuel Footprint Survey. Um, this was started by a student named Kevin Liang, who was, has been a very active Heart Network member over the past few years. And um, we were very uh, lucky to be consulted when he was kind of coming up with the idea of the survey and um, we're all very excited to see the results of that. Um, 
interest, can, can people hear me? Okay. Um, so we're all very excited to see the results of that. And um, actually this year, as some of you may know, the Carnes tour has been, um, has been switched to an online format. So that will very quickly decrease its carbon footprint, I suspect. Um, and, and I think a lot of medical students are a bit sad about this, given that this has been a change made in the context of COVID and um, will prevent students from, from being able to see schools. But I think um, it's definitely a silver lining that um, we'll be saving or we'll be drastically reducing our carbon footprint. Um, next, uh, just to touch on a few of the other things we've been doing, the International Federation of Medical Students Association has a small working group on climate change and we have a very active network, uh, a very active committee member, Megan Kerr, who's been heavily involved in working with that and sharing Hart's work there uh, through that platform. We're, um, we have some students include including George and I, who are also working on a planetary health student interest survey um, and uh, we have Dr. C.A. and other, um, a few other CAPE members who have been fantastic leaders on that project. Um, and uh, so that's an exciting development. And then um, we have also been, uh, or, or one of our members, Kellen Wu, has been working with Dr. Zigby on developing a, an online um, Canadian planetary health curriculum. And uh, finally, um, CAPE has given us the opportunity to hopefully help out, uh, help their um, healthy recovery report by including a little section on uh, how uh, planetary health fits into medical education because that's been a, a big focus of HART. So um, lots of great things in the works that other organizations are doing and that uh, HART has had the chance to help out with. George, you're muted. Um, thank you. Okay, um, before we switch over to Owen to talk about the Greening Healthcare Initiatives, I just want to raise uh, these three points that we, uh, in our webinar with uh, the IFMSA and the uh, Australian medical students, uh, spoke to these three points as sort of um, themes that had emerged from various conversations we've had over the past few weeks, uh, months, and, and um, some of the webinars that we've attended um, and the amazing uh, leaders that we've listened to both through CAPE and, and many others. And, and these, th these sort of themes that, that emerged were that this is a particularly key time um, to act as we return, as, as we develop where we're coming from out of COVID, it's, it's a key time to ensure that we are coming back to a place of safety where we have acted on climate change as well. And um, in this process of building back better, it's uh, key that young people are part of this conversation. Um, and then lastly, in all of this, um, COVID has shown us that, that, you know, these interfaces, these poor interfaces between humans and the natural world are, are so key for us to understand because they impact so much of our health. Um, and so it's more than ever important for us to train uh, physicians to understand those links. Okay. And now over to Owen. Thank you, George and uh, Sasha, for uh, introducing HART as a committee and showcasing the incredible work that um, our colleagues from around the country of Canada are working on. I'm very lucky to be representing the Project Green Healthcare team, um, which consists of me and Jacob Carson, an excellent medical student that, in fact, is uh, graduating today from McMaster University. So congratulations to him. He's going to become an excellent pediatrician working in uh, Kingston soon. Um, but of course, not just me and Jacob that worked on this project, uh, George and Sasha provided excellent feedback throughout and the rest of our CFMS Heart Committee members were a major driving force to ensure that our ideas were relevant to the impacts we wanna make. With that being said, Project Green Healthcare is um, kind of informed by the work that uh, George and Sasha introduced, particularly our first national planetary health education survey that we administered at 17 Canadian medical schools. We identified a couple of important themes, but two of which that we thought were particularly interesting 
and where gaps in Canadian education at the medical school level is that there lacks curricula that effectively encourages students and supports student initiatives and advocacy in the improvement of planetary health around Canada for the medical school curricula delivery. In regards to those two gaps, Jacob and I thought that we are addressing a paucity in service learning opportunities for medical students. And we decided to submit an application for the uh, Strategic Innovation Fund, as, Jacob, as uh, George and Sasha was mentioning. And we are very lucky to have received $12,000 of funding for this project. So how it's going to work is that over the span of two years, Jacob and I aim to develop a network of Canadian medical student teams. These medical student teams are going to be working with collaborators that we are very lucky to be working with, which include the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, as well as the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare, in order to provide some sort of local mentorship through a matching process that will allow medical student teams to have access to a physician leader through CAPE, as well as, a, for example, a hospital administrator or non-physician leader through the CCGHC that can support their work. In addition, because of our grant, we are able to provide these teams with up to $2,000 of refundable financial support, which allows them to enter hospital systems nearby and allow them to conduct a needs assessment of the various green practices or the lack thereof within that hospital system. And from that needs assessment, they're able to inform a quality improvement project to address and improve the sustainability of services delivered in that hospital. To provide a little bit more detail in regards to how we plan to administer this project over the upcoming years, here's a little bit of a brief timeline that provides some tentative um, date limitations. So between now and um, August, it's important for uh, Jacob and I, given that right now is a COVID-19 um, year, it's important to recognize that a lot of the plans that we have set forth were based on a pre-COVID era and being humble and recognizing that this current system, of course, is emerging hopefully healthier, but also that a lot of the systems have modified their practices in keeping with infection control related to COVID-19. As a result of that, we are looking forward to conducting an informal national level needs assessment, looking into interviewing physicians and other members of the healthcare team to see the current status of healthcare in Canada in a COVID environment and what kind of opportunities and barriers exist to greening these systems in the current restraints of the COVID-19 era. After gathering a little bit of data informally through that process, we're gonna be starting an application process and a call for applications for medical student teams in about August, 2020, and later in, at the tail end of this summer. And we'll be selecting a group of, of medical students to form our initial cohort of Project Green Healthcare in the months of September to October. After the selection process has been made and students are matched to local mentors, which are present um, from our collaborations with CAPE and CCGHC, we hope to be able to start sending teams into hospitals to start conducting local green needs assessments. Of course, this totally depends on the status of clerks and pre-clerks returning to hospital settings in a COVID-19 era, given that medical students have been asked to take a step back until uh, capacity is being made in the hospitals for training and education purposes to resume. But we are hoping that in October, we're able to reintroduce students in the hospital to perform these tasks. And with this needs assessment completed over the course of the 2020 um, fall semester, we hope that in upcoming in the new year, in the 2021, from January to June, they're able to continue working, utilizing that data they collected about the needs of the hospital system that they're interested in improving to the direct the quality improvement project with the funding that we have offered in that local hospital. And of course, because this is a two-year project, um, we're going to be reflecting on how the first year goes in order to inform on the timelines of how we will administer Project Green Healthcare in the 2021-2022 academic year. So 
I provided, of course, a pretty executive summary of Project Green Healthcare. I hope that you guys are excited as we are about the process. We have um, here, of course, me and Jacob being very proud to be leading this initiative and very thankful to the Canadian Federation of Medical Students uh, Strategic Innovation Fund for providing funds and providing a belief in our vision and our mission. And we right now, of course, as I mentioned, are interested in connecting with you, determining the needs on the ground in order to ensure that we're leading an initiative that is relevant to the local realities, especially given the constraints of COVID-19. So we would appreciate if you can go on your phones, um, access the QR code here, or fill out this uh, healthcare, uh, Project Green Healthcare interest form that we provided the link here as well. I'll also be very happy to put these links on the chat, so do not feel in any rush to do so. We would love to hear from you, and we'd love to, for you to stay connected with us as we begin this national venture. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll be, of course, happy to take any questions later on. And I look forward to hearing, along with all of us, uh, Yoda Gallo's Indigenous perspective. Uh, thanks so much, Sean. Um, that was great. Is it possible for you to pop that um, the link in the chat? And then, then everyone can uh, access that. Okay, so now I'd like to move on and uh, introduce Yorogalo. Sego Sawa Gwaigo, Yorogalo ni Yungget, Skinna Kiha Gawat Skalawa Gedehana Galina Jeet Nima Gidloda. My name is Yorogalo. I'm a Mohawk Bear Clan from Six Nations, um, and I'm currently the National Officer of Indigenous Health. Um, if you find me just like looking over, I'm tethering. So I'm trying to, I don't know if it works when I'm tethering if the, the phone goes off. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay. It's just on my screen, it says unstable internet connection. So it always like freaks me out. Um, okay, so being the National Officer of Indigenous Health uh, for the CFMS, a lot of folks um, are unaware at each medical school there are local officers of Indigenous Health. And typically we, we like to have junior and senior. And so at each medical school, um, except three schools in Quebec, um, students who um, volunteer for these positions and they host a lot of the events throughout um, campus that have to do with Indigenous health. Um, and we often have resources for a lot of people if they're trying to have electives in Indigenous communities as well. Um, so this picture in particular, um, I had the chance to learn at Akwesasne Reservation. And so Akwesasne Reservation is a unique Mohawk community. It sits on the border of um, Quebec and Ontario, and then also New York State. Um, so it's a really wild place to be. It's really interesting opportunity for medical students um, to learn, um, and she takes residents as well, to learn uh, how to navigate three different healthcare systems, um, how to, how to um, provide care for Indigenous patients, in, in particular, this group um, of Indigenous folks, um, they have a lot of environmental health um, issues or health issues related to environmental racism. So in particular, Dr. Horn has found that a lot of her patients, when they're concerned about a malignancy, when they do the test, they often find that they're more advanced malignancies, despite the um, symptoms just showing up. Um, and a lot of the waters in which they use to get their fish from, to swim in, um, while they grow, like because it's um, the St. Lawrence River, um, there are a lot of companies that actually have leached um, their waste product into the river, which a uh, third ground is uh, contaminated. And then this, of course, uh, for a month, um, I found it really interesting because I myself being Mohawk, um, I was, I think in a different um, category of medical students because I was welcomed in a, in a different way into the community. Um, and so this picture is me because um, I got to participate in a March break. This for this last year, um, March break camp for Indigenous 
um, students that um, it was supposed to be a two day weekend um, workshop for us to make baskets. Um, but because we grow up making baskets, so the, the day and the next day, which I found was quite fun. Go. I don't know if it's lagging on my end or not. Yeah, we just had a lag on the last couple of things you said. I wonder, um, panelists, if we all turn off our videos, will there be, will we get better? I might also turn mine off because that might help as well. Yeah, and we've still got the screen share, so yeah. Okay, we'll, awesome. Fingers crossed. Yeah, okay, can you um, switch it, George? I have no idea where I left off, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, You're also much clearer now, so thanks everybody. Okay, awesome. Um, so this is um, part of that elective I got to uh, participate in um, placements with uh, traditional medicine uh, knowledge practitioners um, within the community. And so this slide is a picture I took in the community and it shows how Indigenous people think of health. Um, so a lot of people, they state um, that we believe our health is um, like our mental health, our spiritual health, our emotional health, and our physical health. Um, but that is quite a quite simplistic view of the, the depth of that. And so I found this picture was quite amazing that Akosasne was able to capture just as patients might think of in terms of health. And so when we're talking about um trying to keep patients well who are indigenous um and we say physical health there are different things for indigenous folks who um when they when they look at this they can see, they can see that when if they're trying to um work on their physical health or their mental health that there are different ways in which we can do that um, and of course a lot of this knowledge um would have been passed down but has has been lost due to um a lot of the colonial efforts um residential schools and things like that so um i always like to include it in my slides because a lot of people see the medicine wheel and they don't really um see the the depth of it um you can go to the next slide george all right so as an indigenous person uh, specifically as a mohawk woman um a lot of what i was raised with is a lot of our treaty knowledge. And I feel like a lot of um, non-Indigenous folks are beginning to understand that treaties are agreements that we made with each other um, as Indigenous people, but they don't realize that they also are included in this. Um, so when we look at our responsibility or accountability to other beings in this world, not just human beings, but animals and the water and the wind and the um, earth and all of, all of the beings that live here, um, we actually have agreements that say how we should conduct ourselves. And so the very top one is the two row wampum belt. A lot of people have seen this um, and may not know its origins. Um, before European contact, this wampum was made with my uh, group Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. Um, and after European contact, we actually um, made it with the, um, it was the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch and, and the Haudenosaunee in France. And um, I believe also the Haudenosaunee and the US, but we don't actually have this agreement with um, Canada because Canada was not um, a thing back then. Um, and so this says that we have to, um, our group is on their side and um, we're constantly working together to maintain our relationship with one another. Um, and so it's a really good um, agreement that was made before these other agreements. And so the middle one is called the dish with one spoon. And so this again was with the Anishinaabe because we shared a lot of ground. So where I am right now is Six Nations Reserve, which is about 40 minutes away from Hamilton. Um, and so Hamilton is actually where, Hamilton, Niagara, um, Toronto is where this treaty actually originates from. And so this treaty, it says that um, the earth is a bowl 
and we all have this one spoon. And so if you're eating and sharing food with people and you have one dish and one spoon, you want to make sure that you don't take too much, that you leave the bowl in, in, in the same state that you would if you were sharing food and you wanted them to share it in a clean way. Um, you wouldn't give them a broken. It's all about sharing land and resources um, and taking care of those resources. So this is what we rely on and look to when we talk about us being caretakers of the land. Um, and then the very last one is actually um, includes every single person on this call. If you call yourself a Canadian person, this is this includes you as well. And so most treaties include treaties that happened before them. So not only is the last one your treaty, but all of these are treaties that you have to follow as well. So the Treaty of Fort Niagara, you can tell this is the post-contact one because it has numbers in it. So this was in 1764 and it happened in the Fort Niagara. And there were 24 indigenous nations, um, including mine. And they met with um, the British, like the Dominion of Canada, uh, British um, representatives. And they said that when Canada becomes, when, when they invite people from Britain, from the US into Canada, into this area that we want to call Canada, um, that we need to ensure that everyone knows that they're treaty people. Um, and what that means is that you are responsible for the land, just as we are. And so I think a lot of people today, they don't really know that when we say we are all treaty people, this is, this is your treaty. This is your treaty because somebody before you made this agreement saying that if you call yourself a Canadian citizen, uh, a citizen of this land, that this agreement is binding to you and is also binding to uh, the Indigenous nations that live in Canada. And it, and it has a lot of meaning of caretaking for each other and the, the land and all the resources here. Um, and a lot of the agreements were made and it's kind of like you're supposed to treat everyone like family. So everyone who immigrants he immigrates are of, and the way that we view it a lot of the time um, lost its meaning on the other side when it was written down into English. Um, for a lot of Indigenous nations, when we see our um, translation documents from this, um, it has a lot more meaning because it shows that um, a lot of a lot of these have been violated. Um, a lot of us. Um, might not treat everyone like they're, they are our family members and a lot of us might not take care of the land and the resources that we should be. Um, and so I brought this up because um, it shows an interesting, um, it, it has a different meaning when you talk about being interested in environmental health and actually having a responsibility. You are accountable to the land because of these agreements. You are accountable to other people because of these agreements. If you are a person living in Canada, these are your treaties and, and there are many more um, that you are responsible for. Um, so that's why I wanted to bring those up. If we wanna go to the next slide. So this shows my accountability. Um, so I'm from Six Nations Reserve. I was raised a lot of the time um, taking care of the land and uh, a lot of our stories we talk about the land is our mother um, and I was trying to think of a way um, I know that I'm going to be a physician and I know that a lot of people assume when you're a physician you're going to have like the latest um, however I was trying to think of a way that I could um, do this in a good way um, that as a physician in the future, how can I walk the talk of being a Haudenosaunee person who cares for the land and also um, make sure I have a place to live, um, make sure I have just what I need and I'm not taking more than I need. Um, so that's when I kind of fell in love with the tiny house movement. 
um, and I started building a tiny house. Um, so this is a my tiny house. I actually just took this picture like uh, today because um, I didn't have any updated pictures uh, that we built from um, up from the flatbed. And um, I realized that in order for me to actually reduce my, my carbon footprint to actually live um, the way that I want to live, um, to let go of the expectations that society have around having to have a normal, quote unquote, normal house that has all of this space that you don't actually need. Um, what do I actually need? And for me, I actually literally documented where I went in my house for a week. And that was, I needed a place to rest my head, I needed a place to put my clothing, I needed a bathroom, I needed a place to cook food, and then maybe a place to study and, and um, have guests. And so all of that is just what I need, and that is what is in this house. Um, two years to get where we are right now, but I'm actually pretty proud of where we are. Um, me and my stepfather have built this. Um, and the at right there is the, um, the uh, Instagram page for the tiny house. It's basically the word in Mohawk is Niga Nusa'a, and it basically just means a very small house. Um, so I'm actually working on trying to finish it in the next um, little while because we're, we're supposed to re be returning back to clinical duties and I don't wanna risk um, transmitting uh, COVID to my family members because I live in a, a household full of six people. Um, and so I want to make sure that um, it is prepared to be moved in in the next few months um, so that I can reduce their risk of transmission. Um, my long-term goal for it is to move it wherever I go to residency. So I have to find a place that is um, able to house me, hopefully probably outside of a major city center because a lot of cities don't like tiny houses. Um, I hope to com be completely off the grid and um, and not reliable on um, on the grid and yeah I, this is how I want to live and this is how I want to I want other people to consider when we think about planetary health um, to take drastic steps um, and, to, and to walk the talk um, and yeah uh, next slide so this is what I want. I, I, my uncle found this in the woods. And so um, I, when we talk about people in Canada um, walking the talk or trying to engage with Indigenous communities, there, there seems to be a lot of hesitation. Um, and I think a lot of people, they know the concept of blood memory or, or like collective conscience or um, teachings that have been passed down through our our um, our intergenerational um, DNA, and we talk about intergenerational trauma, but we also talk about intergenerational healing and or us having blood memory. And I don't think Indigenous people are the exception. I think that a lot of people in Canada, if you are more than a first generation, if you're a second, third, fourth, fifth generation Canadian, I think a lot of the hesitation comes from policies like this. So in Canada, if you were a non-Native person, you could not come on a reserve. And this still kind of is persuasive in, in society. I get asked all the time if people are allowed on the reserve, if the reserve is closed, if they have to have special ID. And pre-COVID, I said no. Now my community, particularly because of COVID, we have blockades and we're only allowing community members in or delivery folks. Um, but I think it's an interesting um, thing that we have to start discussing that a lot of people in Canada don't think that they can engage in, in Indigenous issues or that they, um, they're not allowed in our communities. Um, and so for me, how does this seep into the lack of physicians that we have on reserve if people think that they're not allowed on reserve? Um, if, we, if we try and have open conversations that you won't, um, none of this is like, I'm, this sign is from like the 60s and 70s, um, but none of this like holds anything today. You can come on the reserve, you can work on the reserve. Um, so I, I throw it in there because I always find it um, quite a interesting um, 
conversation started with a lot of Canadian folks because um, they might not realize that that this might be within their own um, blood memory and they have a hesitation with working in community or coming to our communities because there used to be laws that they weren't allowed. Um, next slide. So this is um, kind of where we end up. Um, I wanted, I was approached by um, George and Sasha about um, engaging with heart. And so I put a fire there because when we have engagements and when we made those treaties as Indigenous people, um, we always did it, um, whether symbolically or literally, we did it over a fire. And we talk about the issue until the issue is ironed out. And we come back to it if somebody feels uneasy about it. And when we talk about it, we say that we pass it over to the fire. And so say if I wanted to develop this protocol of engagement, I could develop it and then pass it over to the, to the fire to George and Sasha and those folks at heart. And then they would discuss any issues that they have and they pass it over the fire to me and we go back and forth until it's evened out. And so um, if a lot of folks know um, a lot of what um, modern day democracy, um, it, the roots of that were based on my confederacy and how we dealt with things. Um, we would deal with issues, we would deal with how to engage with people, treaties, um, the protocol, um, until it was ironed out so everyone felt comfortable and we wouldn't move forward unless everyone was on the same page. And so using this mindset of this indigenous knowledge that I have, um, when I was approached by Hart to, to, um, to have indigenous knowledge or indigenous um, worldviews integrated into Hart, this is where my mind went right away is how can we can acknowledge how we can appropriately engage with indigenous communities um, and uh, indigenous people, people on the front line who are trying to do environmental work. Um, this involves acknowledging where we are. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations about um, the foundations of uh, organizations um, not necessarily having indigenous people there when they formed the foundation. And so that indigenous input isn't there with the foundation. However, moving forward from that, how do we move forward from that? How do we then now integrate Indigenous knowledge into that and move forward? Um, we think it has to be an, a living agreement. We have to make sure that we're not setting these protocols of how to engage appropriately on because people who come after us are going to have to um, also uh, agree to this and so we want it to be a living agreement because if something changes like COVID and all of a sudden our lives are shifting we have to we have to work with that um, and then so I have a master's in um, sociology and I did a lot of um, participatory action research um, and so those also guide me um, and the, those guiding principles around how to engage appropriately with um, communities is another thing I think that's also why I like sociology so well is that it aligned with indigenous knowledge um, and the framework that we can use is based on engaging with community from PAR uh, research and then um, we also want to uh, build from existing framework so um, folks that were um, around in the 90s um, might have heard of RCAP um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People which is in 1996 um, they laid out over 3,000 recommendations for the government of Canada to ensure that um, Indigenous lives uh, are a bit more equitable uh, to Canadian folks. Um, and then we have like the TRC calls to action, we have OCAP, we have the murdered and missing um, inquiry. And so we have so many different frameworks on how to properly engage with Indigenous folks. Um, that I feel like it's, um, it feels a lot better doing it this way because we're doing it in a good way rather than um, tokenism. I have been a part of 
planning committees or different things where people have expressed that they need indigenous input or engagement um, and they don't it doesn't feel right to me and been having conversations about how to do this um, and we're open to suggestions from each other we're passing it back and forth across that fire trying to um, create some sort of document or something that will have the protocols of how we want to engage with each other and the going forward how the National Office of Indigenous Health, the CFMS and um, HEART can properly engage with Indigenous issues and, and another. Um, and I think that's it for my slides. Um, George, is there anything you wanted to add? Hey, uh, thanks so much, Yorigalo. That was uh, really powerful and, and absolutely want to, we want to engage in this process of passing these protocols back and forth across the fire until both sides are happy. And, and, and I agree, I, I think this is something that, that Heart is particularly, you know, close to this because we have, we're based on these ideas of, of planetary health, which is so um, ingrained within indigenous cultures, it's foundational. Um, but we also within Heart recognize that um, the impacts of climate change are, are most threatening for for indigenous communities on the front line. So we wanna make sure that that is front and center in the work that we do. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, um, we're almost at the, the end and I wanna thank you all again so much for your time and your care and your wisdom. There were in the chat um, three really short questions. One was, have you worked with divestment on campus? Um, another was, are you, is anyone doing anything related to fossil free food and health. And um, the third was, do you know whether there is an equivalent nursing um, organization? Are the three that I found in the, in the chat and in the question. So if someone, if in the last minute, someone has the answers to those, that would be fantastic. So I can speak a little bit to the divestment question. Um, I know this hasn't been something um, that as Heart we have been as actively involved as perhaps we could be. Um, but I know that um, this past year, the CFMS as an organization did divest its um, funds. So that was a very exciting step from the CFMS's perspective and, um, and I'd like to think that hopefully our work inspired them a little bit, but uh, certainly we have to give them credit. They, they, um, they really took this initiative on and um, did that sort of on, on behalf of the entire student organization. Um, in terms of lo more local kind of um, school-based divestment projects, I know personally at Queen's, the Queen's Environmental Advocacy and Medicine Group is heavily involved with the Queen's Divest groups, but um, we haven't we haven't necessarily engaged as much with that um, as a heart committee. And it's it's definitely an interesting question for moving forward because I know that that's something that Cape is actively involved in. It they have a divestment subcommittee. Thanks. Anyone? And, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll I'll just jump in quickly and speak to the. Uh, the point around um, the nursing students. We, we have reached out to uh, the head of the global health uh, portfolio at the Canadian uh, student, Nursing Student Association. Um, her name is uh, Melanie Marquez. Um, and she's, they're engaging in a lot of work around, um, similarly around educating nursing students and, and sort of engaging in greening healthcare initiatives. So we're hopeful to um, potentially find ways to work with them on those. There is also a, a nursing association, of, I'm blanking on the name right now, which is essentially a proxy to what CAPE is. Kane. Kane, yeah. Yeah, so the Canadian Association of Nursing, Nurses for the Environment. Um, and I'm not sure if they have a student chapter. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I think that um, as I know that um, there are um, there are folks working on the intersections of sort of the food system and 
um, and what that means for health and also for the planet. Um, and that actually brings us into a really nice transition for me to plug next week's webinar, which is both um, picking up on what Owen was talking about around um, greening the healthcare system and um, also looking at, at making a more sustainable food system. So um, once again, thank you all um, our participants for joining us and again, our, um, our fantastic panel um, of panelists for, for sharing with us today and for your time and your knowledge and your wisdom and your passion. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us and have a lovely rest of your Thursday. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you so much for having me.